Nine Life Lessons from a Rather Surprising Source, The Hardy Boys. This is the focus group. It's the savvy side of nine to five. Listen. Bueller. 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 Laugh. <laughs> and learn. Negotiation. This is what you do in business. This is the focus group with Tim Bennett. S T A U N C H. And John Nash. Keep your clothes looking neat and clean. We're all business. Except when we're not. Welcome to the Focus Group. John Nash here with my good friend and co-host, Mr. Tim Bennett. Hello. The week before Thanksgiving. Everybody going to start? <laughs> Can you dun, tell how excited uh, I am? Look at week before Thanksgiving. I got to tell you. All right. I'll get, everyone I'll, let me get out of the way sexy. this one little piece. But as everyone feeling sexy. That was Edie. done her you 600th Zumanity Out in Vegas. Focusgroupradio.com is our website. Go there to check out all the platforms we're on, both audio and visual. And if you're joining us today live on Facebook or YouTube, thank you. By all means, join the conversation at 877-962-6846. So Tim picked up. You know me so well that the body language just like <laughs> yeah, nice, holidays. Nice. You know, as a kid, I really loved the holidays, but as an adult, they seem to be burdened. They're fun, and I love seeing family and friends, but there's all this other stuff that's got to get done, and a lot of money gets spent. And I just kind of go crazy. So, I had I was thinking today, and when I was coming up on the train, dangerous thing that I thinking. know, but I, I was thinking <laughs> we we we've, we've become as a country very politically. Correct. In some aspects, I think that's good. Some other aspects, I think we've gone too far. But I had a fifth grade teacher, and you know, where John and I went to school in Connecticut, it was a little bit in Southbury. Yeah, okay. a little bit new agey, I guess, for lack of a better word. And our whole month of October, up until Thanksgiving, the only thing we did was we put together our own Thanksgiving Day parade. Uh. And half the class. You made your turkey. You'd put your hand down. That half the <laughs> class were half the class were pilgrims. Half the class were Indians. And there was and no. We came together and we did this. We had a meal at the end um, before Thanksgiving, but we we took trash bags and taped them together and got vacuums and filled them up to do balloons. And we marched around the schoolyard. They made all the kids come out and watch the parade. But did that happen today? Well, that's what I. So the cowboy, the uh, pilgrims and Indians, no, not allowed. Not allowed, no. And. I'm not sure that the, that parents would allow this four or five week thing, but when I thought about it, it created teamwork, creativity. Someone had to organize the parade. You had to put out an announcement. They had us do a press release. We built the balloons. We organized. So as much as we thought it was fun, there was actually probably a, a lot of learning, a learning in there. And, and the fact that I'm still talking about it. 40 years later. You, I, I literally was going to interrupt you and say the fact that you're bringing this up now means that you definitely got later, something out of it. Was, yeah. Only 10 years later. 10 years, whatever it was. So, it, so that was your fifth grade. Fifth grade. So in my fifth grade, when I was in Memorial, you, your, your school... Your I was country, Rochambeau. You were Rochambeau. So Tim and I, or me and Tim, our towns were next to each other, and they're regionalized. And we, we met at the high school level, actually, but we went to separate um, elementary and secondary schools. So Memorial, I was in band. I was learning to play trumpet. And the focus from Thanksgiving forward was the Christmas, Christmas concert. concert. <laughs> Which I'm not so sure they have those anymore, either. And... It's even down to the point where if I found an old program for one of our Christmas concerts, and I don't even know if they would allow some of the songs to be played. There's religious, you know, because yeah. it was about the birth, you know, the birth of Jesus, Merry Christmas, Silent Night, and uh, but Thanksgiving uh, of the holidays is one of my favorites because it's sort of non-denominational. At the very least, you can say it's a day where you're going to get together with friends and family, have a nice dinner. And what I always marveled at, too, is different um, people based upon their nationality, where they were from, would celebrate different, differently. Yeah. So if you were Polish, you had different foods maybe than the Italians might have. Or the, but it was you're, you're right, John. It was get together, yeah, they have, a, have, have a great great meal and with family and friends or your, your chosen family. And I know, I know for, for me and for Tim when we were in college, it was also the time that, and after many, many years afterwards, it's our one time of the year we were all usually in the same town again. And we got together with our friend Marianne and mom and dad mom and dad and by the way our friend Marianne's mom and dad were kind of surrogate mom and dads to us in a really fun well, everybody way. clustered at their house oh yeah and then uh, <laughs> they held her mom and dad held had, held court there and her mom had the uh, she had a police scanner uh, on, in the of the plectron <laughs> We got a break in, <laughs> and then her head would turn slightly, and she goes, "Oh, I know that house." 
learned a lot from them, I tell you. Boys in the booth. Look at them popping up, Garrett and John. Are you, uh, are you, you guys um, you stay in town? Getting ready for the big holiday season coming oh, up? Oh, yeah. Stay in town, ain't with family. Have a good meal with family. How about yourselves? I'm in town. I'm yeah, to I go to Long Island. Yeah. Listen, <laughs> eh. I hate it. You hate it? I hate all the holidays. Do you Especially really? Because that's really? now Christmas songs start. Oh, and Garrett. that's what I hate the most. Yep. Oh, you don't love a good Christmas, Christmas song? He no. might have liked a Christmas song at one point, yeah. but now they beat it to death that, like a horse. As <laughs> much as Garrett and I were separated at birth. No, Garrett and I are now. This is now you, you and yeah, him. Because I am. John is Mr. Grump the same about the songs holidays. every year after year. Well, they only Grinch. wrote like 25 Christmas songs. You uh -huh. should come you know. up with one. All you need is one song. I worked with a woman who did that. Everyone knows it's windy. Put, put the family through school. Did everything. <laughs> one song. All you need is one song. All right. Uh, okay, and if it's a Christmas one, well, you good luck going. writing a Christmas song today. Prince do in 1999. Today. I mean, it was guaranteed 20 years later to make some more coin. <laughs> All right, I have a little tiny item I want to share. Uh -oh. um, so I, I have this, I'm on a kick now. I think maybe for the rest of my life. If I want to buy oh. an art book or something of that nature, I refuse to pay full price. I want to pay 10 bucks. So one of my animation mentors, one of my teachers uh, who lives up in Canada, recommended a book by a man um, who used to lecture and teach Disney artists. So I found the book. It's a paperback. It's all his collected lectures and sketches. I ordered it from a place in Texas called uh, Texas Exile. And it was like $12. came yesterday in media mail. And in it, on, the, on one side of the invoice, if John can come in here, there was a handwritten note. And the note, on top of being handwritten, it's written in cursive. Now, Tim has talked about this before, about the ability to read cursive handwriting. By the look right? at it, that person's at least 75. Because <laughs> it's actually legible? It's le and it's got the curly cues. All the curly and... stuff. So it said, Dear Mr. Nash, thank you for choosing Texas Exile. We hope you enjoy your new year. Drawing for, drawn for Life, 20 Years of Disney Animation Master Classes. May I recommend some other titles? Oh. And she actually lists about four titles uh, around animation and, and specifically one I had not heard of called Walt Disney Hollywood's Dark Prince. Turns out to be a biography of Disney and how he had terrible bouts with depression and alcoholism, but he ended up creating one of the most you know, memorable brands. But she ends by saying, questions or concerns, please contact us here at you know Texas Exile and her email address. And she and I just- We just happen to have those four books in stock. <laughs> well, okay. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Are but you going to order them? I, I am going to order the Disney, the, the Dark Are you gonna Prince You're going to look to see if she has I'm them? I'm going to see if she has Very them. Good. But I just want to or say he? that what a nice, unexpected thing to receive yeah. in a simple order is someone who looked at the title and said, oh, they're into animation. I, I think they might like these books. That's somebody too. who loves their, loves their used bookstore. Yeah. Which, which, which you which, find I in like a lot that. of those people I like in those that. stores. Yeah. That's cool. All right, so you know one of the great things about doing our show here in the studio with the boys in the booth and our beautiful set, and of course the visuals of me and Tim, is that we get to talk the visuals. about the visuals, the powerful visuals, the stunning visuals. We get to talk about clothing, which is something we never used to actually be able to do on our old platform uh, because we couldn't necessarily show it. And one of our partners here, and we've talked about them before, is Mac Weldon. And I'd love you to try going over to MacWeldon.com. And in fact, I'll say it right now and say it through this little piece we're going to do. If you order from Mac Weldon and use the code FOCUS, you get 20% off your order. So the last time me and Tim talked about Mac Weldon, we had both sampled uh, some underwear. I did briefs. You did boxers, boxer briefs. which you liked. Boxer loved briefs. Great waistband. And, you also and loved the T-shirt that fit you perfectly. I love the T-shirt, and I also love the socks because they have the built-in cushion on them. Okay. On the, on and the, I have a V-neck T-shirt that I got that's red. That's beautiful. I like it too, and um, I still wear my briefs. I brought with me today a shirt that I ordered from Mac Weldon. This is a pullover. It's navy blue. It might be hard on the see in the camera, but there's some nice detail. I like that. It's super comfortable. It's gone through the wash about four times now. It is my go-to pullover shirt. I, uh, in fact, I might order another one, so I have one in each location, <laughs> one in my country place and one here in the city. You have a pullover. Where's your pullover? Well, aside from the, as I said, I love the socks with the cushioned footbed and the, and the underwear, which I still have. Unfortunately, my other two items have been stolen. <laughs> Stolen is should be in air quotes, but so this why don't you is explain? this is why Mac, Mac Weldon is good clothing. So anyone who knows me knows I'm kind of famous for my half, half zipper 
shirts that I always wear, and I probably have five or six different brands. Is there a name for this? this is, it's just a half zip. Okay. But Mac Weldon has one, and it's called the Ace Half Zip Sweatshirt. It's made with French terry. It's different than others in that it's got zip pockets. It's 95% uh, cotton. It's got a versatile collar. It's very comfortable. I love it. And I got it specifically because I knew we were doing the read this week. And I ordered it, and so for the last two days, I've been ripping my house apart. Trying to find your app zip. And I was like, where the heck is it? So I called Richard by any chance. He's like, oh, yeah, I took that. I said, what do you mean you took that? He goes, I took that, and I took the T-shirt. I said, well, <laughs> I, he just think he that goes, he goes, real, they're, he said, they're great. You've got enough of that stuff. I said, no, I don't. I only have one, Mac no, Weldon. No. And I said, he goes, well, you can order another one. I said, well, it was my best one. And I was supposed to wear it on the show today because we're doing the, the read for Mac Weldon. I want to tell everybody about it. So if you're watching, there's a picture of it. Yeah, it, it's sharp. Richard's wearing it somewhere down probably in Rehoboth Beach. So I will, uh, I'm going to have to get another one. It's gone. Well, it's it, gone. When I met Tim before the show today for a bite to eat, he was very distressed by the lack of this shirt. And I said, well, what do you mean it was stolen? And I know that you don't go to a laundromat or something, which when you would. And then he says, no, Richard, just, I'm like, that's not stolen. I went through, and I know I didn't wash it. I went through dirty, it Tim wearing I went through dirty <laughs> laundry baskets. I even checked in the closet to make sure it didn't get hung up. But I have a specific place where all these, you know, foldable half zip things are. And um, so, and there's the pocket that they're showing there. On it's very the convenient. Screen. Yeah, way. which a lot of those those sort of um, shirts don't have. So as John mentioned, if you go to Focus Group, um, actually in our in our Facebook page today, we mentioned uh, Focus Group Radio, our Facebook page. Yeah, right. The discount. We, you we get. mentioned the discount, but if uh, you go to macweldon.com and as you check out, if you type in the promo code Focus F O C U S, you'll actually see our caricature there on the page. Oh, which really? Is pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. I think. And uh, and you'll get um, twenty percent off your first order. And really, it's it's uh, it's great quality clothes, and we we enjoy wearing it and work. And it's so great that working them. Yours is stolen. So great, mine's stolen. <laughs> All right. You do. Well, we want to thank Mac Weldon. So, again, check out MacWeldon.com. And if you buy from them and it's your a new order, by all means, take advantage of the code FOCUS, F-O-C-U-S, and save 20% off. All right. Mr. Bennett, besides stolen Mac Weldon clothing, what caught your eye? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. Well, it was bound to happen. This is one of the things where uh, either everything old is new again or... And uh, we, John and I have a good friend, um, I'll mention his name, Tim Mahoney. And one of my favorite quotes, he, he's now a global CMO at a major car brand. But one of his famous lines says, John and I one time met him at a, at a cocktail lounge. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were talking about something and he just smirked and he said, in the, in the whorehouse called marketing, there isn't a bed that hasn't been slept in. <laughs> You know, and for him to do that kind of proclamation right. statement, we all laugh. Meaning there's no new ideas. So nothing, for nothing is new. For years, anyone who's ever gone out to a club or a bar, probably in the 70s, 80s, even 90s, used to go to some of these bars and people would do sampling. So there was sampling of, it might have been vodka or jello shots, and yep. or there would be uh, perhaps uh, beverage companies would be throwing out t shirts and so forth. Well, not to be outdone, the uh, Heavy Hitters, which is a Southern California vape company, um, is now doing sampling, and they're looking for brand ambassadors to travel around and smoke weed and, uh, and get paid for it. And to teach people how to smoke Teach weed, people right? how to pay I, for it. So, that was my impression from when I looked at what you had put so together. So the headline is, get paid to smoke marijuana. And I'll just tell you what, and then I'll tell you what the job description is. But it's California-based vape company, Heavy Hitters, is hiring brand ambassadors to travel around the country and promote their products at events. You'll be paid $1,200 a month, plus you'll get a $500 credit for Heavy Hitters products, so you can order the vaping stuff or whatever you need. And in order to apply, you have to upload a 60-second video to YouTube and Instagram and explain why you're perfect for the job. <laughs> okay, wait, hit the pause button. How many videos are gonna come into this thing with people blowing smoke into the camera? Wait a minute, where's Garrett and John? Did they leave? <laughs> you guys you guys wanna be ambassadors? I'm not sure it pays enough. I mean, you think about it, right? You, yeah, you, I don't know. That's twelve hundred so would it be be it'd be twelve fourteen thousand bucks? So it says uh so the job description listed on one of the online services says travel, quote, travel, smoke weed, get paid. 
It's truly looks, it's, the job is as simple as this. Each ambassador will be generously compensated, earning $1,200 a month in cash, plus a $500 credit for heavy hitters. You'll enjoy all expense paid travel to any and all cannabis events around the country. You'll be the first to try all the new strains and products from heavy hitters. And you'll work closely with prominent dispensaries. To be considered, again, upload your video. Tell us why you have the special skills to represent the brand. You just have to tag, uh, it's at heavy tag would be the. Uh, so I have a, a theory about uh -oh. this, that if you want to be an ambassador for this bunch, don't blow smoke into the camera. Don't light a bong on camera. Don't be stoned. Be, be in a nice shirt or a nice outfit and talk about just your people skills, your, how you relate to people. Because I think that they're going to get a ton of these things where people are like, man, I know how to. Well, I want to go watch them because they're going to be all on YouTube and Instagram. You could actually. Yeah, because so they're, they're all going to be tagged heavy. They're all tagged at heavy is the oh, tag. Oh, Tim, so... where'd you find this piece? This was in, it, you know, I think of all places it was in Business Insider, and they were talking about how how the cannabis companies are really replicating a lot of what the beverage companies have done. And brands like Coca-Cola and Coors Light and Miller Sampling. are all getting involved yeah. with this cannabis trade because they expect this is going to be the next big moneymaker. I was trying to figure out what a cannabis event was, was though. Well, it could Grateful be Dead concert. It could I mean, be that's... either it could be either like you know when we were kids and we all took naps during the day. I mean, <laughs> it could be a bunch of cots laying out and everybody's falling you asleep. Know, I thought if you were a college kid, but but you know, twelve hundred a month, so that's twelve. It's, two, it's not it's, it's not enough money to live on. But I don't, I don't know. And and, and as you know, a college I, kid, you really can't travel the country. Now I imagine as a side gig, if you had something else going on, you're maybe a you're a writer or a blogger, or somehow you're bringing in extra money, that this would freelance be freelance journalist. This could be an interesting little side gig. But I do bet you that whoever gets these jobs are going to be pretty buttoned up. You think? Oh yeah, I do. I mean, there, there's a business side to this, right? They're not they're not just handing out this stuff, you know. This. Well, you want to get people to buy their product. Exactly. You want them to be, you know, you want to align with you the You want brand. to buy heavy hitters. And speaking of which, later in the broadcast, we're going to do a shop talk um, about an interesting consumer score that no one knows. Exists. That exists, but it's used all the time in how people, how companies treat us. That company, it someday is going to have one of those scores for their, for their consumers as well, right? That's a good one. So that's what caught my eye. Mine's a little different. Comes to us from the United Kingdom. Uh... Clearcast is a political body in the UK that has been tasked with making sure that commercial broadcasts do not breach political advertising rules. So if there's an ad that's being aired and there's a tinge of pol uh, politics in it, the ad could be pulled. So there's a supermarket chain in the UK called Iceland. I mean... First of all, I C E L A N D. Like the country. Yeah, I thought, okay, so from a branding point of view, I I don't think they're from Iceland. It's just called Iceland. I could be wrong. Uh, major UK supermarket chain. And they, they are the first chain to ban products containing palm oil uh, from their own in house products. And that's because palm oil is extremely environmentally destructive to, to get at. And in fact, this commercial that they put on briefly was originally produced by Greenpeace over a year ago, and it was voiced by Emma Thompson. And it's a little cartoon about a girl and something called that she calls the orangutan, which is actually slang for an orangutan in her room. And it shows how the orangutan is going around the room and hurting things. And then it shows what the orangutan's environment's been decimated by with the, the palm oil thing. It was pulled off the air. I, John, I think we have it. We don't have to play. I, I think I sent a, that one. There There's it is. There's a orangutan yeah. in my bedroom, and I don't know what to do. She plays with all my teddies and keeps borrowing my shoe. She destroys all of my houseplants, and she keeps on shouting, ooh. She throws away my chocolate, and she howls at my shampoo. There's a orangutan in my bedroom, and I don't want her to stay. So I told the naughty orangutan that she had to go away. Oh, Rangtan in my bedroom, just before you go, why were you in my bedroom? I really want to know. There's a human in my forest, and I don't know what to do. He destroyed all of our trees for your food and your shampoo. There's a human in my forest, and I don't know what to do. He took away my mother, and I'm scared he'll take me too. There are humans in my forest, and I don't know what to do. They're burning it for palm oil. So I thought I'd stay with you. Oh, orangutan in my bedroom. Now I do know what to do. 
I'll fight to save your home and I'll stop you feeling blue. I'll share your story far and wide so others can fight too. Oh, Rangtan in my bedroom, I swear it on the stars. The future's not yet written, but I'll make sure it is ours. So that... <laughs> I like that twist, John. A little shark at the end. Um, so that was banned. Oh, you're crying, Tim. Um, 25 orangutans are killed each day in the making of palm oil. Um, they're being driven to extinction. But the thing about this is, the minute it was banned, it went crazy viral. So It's creepy. Is it? <laughs> did, 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 I see, did I miss something? Guys, what do you think? John Garrett, is it creepy? I mean, uh, I don't know about creepy, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does it seem heavy-handed, or... It, I mean, it, it is, kid, yeah, if you were a little Garrett, kid... Inside, Garrett, it's be, heavy. I, I, I think Garrett afraid, nailed it. It's heavy. <laughs> it's, I don't know that I'd be scared, but it's, it's a heavy message. I mean, the, their environment's being destroyed yeah. to, to extract palm oil. So the, the weird thing is about this, when you ban something, you inadvertently make it a hit. The minute this, oh, yeah. we, so this is going to be the Christmas ad for Iceland, the supermarket chain. Christmas ad? Yeah, yes. Okay. I, oh, I should have said that at the Christmas. beginning. It's, it's the best time of the year. Oh, by golly. Oh, palm oil. Killing orangutans. So you nailed it, Tim. You got the, the white sheet down. So ClearCast, the body that does this policing, bans it. The minute they ban it, it goes crazy viral on YouTube and, and Twitter and the whole, and, and so it, it, paradoxically, the best publicity you could ever get for yeah. something like this was doing exactly what they did. They banned it. So that's what caught my eye. It's like when Madonna's sex book was banned. It, sold it went, out everywhere. Sold out. You couldn't even buy a copy of it, which is just crazy. Well, you know who uses palm oil? Oreos. Ooh. They do, do they? Yeah. How do you know that? Because well, I just, I kept hearing things about this palm oil killing things, and it said Oreos and one other candy kind of thing uses it the most. I forget what, what it was. Uh oh, probably Twizzlers. <laughs> Who my we, we, might, we might have a rang tang coming into the studio next time we do an Oreo taste test, right? I I do think it's a shame when the, you, you show and they they do a lot of these things on the whether it's National Geographic Channel or whatever uh, they show these environments that we're just clear cutting in a rainforest yeah. or something. It is it is criminal. Um, but I don't know how you stop it in some of these countries. It's like the poaching of the rhinos for the horns or, or some what, of What did you find, Garrett? So it's Oreos, Ritz crackers, and Cadbury chocolate bars. Wow. That's an interesting mix. They're different yes. companies, too. Palm oil. I wonder yeah. if you can make it. Obviously, it must be either a cost thing or a taste thing, right? It's a substitute for something, or it's an additive. Substitute and, for uh, fat or oil, right? You or know, vegetable uh, oil. Because you have olive oil, vegetable oil, canola oil. You have palm oil. I never really, I never really thought of palm oil as being a controversial. No, I didn't think. But there you go. So, uh, what's the business oh, birthday? On that today? happy note. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. Nothing runs like a deer, John Nash. Robert W. Lane, born today, November 14th, 1949. He's 69 years old. He served as chief executive officer of the John Deere or the Deere and Company from 2000 to 2009. He retired as chairman of the board in February 2010. He also served on several boards. This is where you and I get mad. You know, these people get a couple hundred thousand for sitting around and pontificating like seagulls. They come and they squawk, they poop, they leave. They don't really do anything. <laughs> they they just... come and they squat and they poop. And they leave. Okay, I just a board said seat's the best thing you can have. They pay, I think, a quarter million dollars a year sometimes. But just sit there and say, here's what I would do. All right, next, let's have All lunch. Right. Go home. Here's your check. So he's, he sits on the board of the Northern Trust Company, General Electric, BMW, and Verizon. I mean, a million bucks a year. Well, at least a le million or, you know, yeah. It pisses me off. You and I did something wrong. Anyway, he was ranked 10th by the Forbes magazine as the top CEO based on his compensation for 2009. So the John Deere, or the Deere Company, as many of you know, I don't, it, the green, of course, ubiquitous green, green tractors and, and everything. Yellow type. But it's an American corporation, manufactures agricultural construction, forestry machinery, and drive trains, axles, axles, transmissions, gearboxes, so forth and so on. It was the 102nd largest company in 2018 based on the Fortune 500. It, um, it's on the New York Stock Exchange, of course. Their slogan forever has been, nothing runs like a deer. The logo that they use of that deer, do you want to guess how long they've used that for? 
Um, I want to say since the company's founding, almost. You're exactly right. In eighteen, the eighteen hundreds, they've used that that. They've streamlined uh, it a bit, but it's logo for over one hundred and fifty-five years, and uh, they're based in Grand. Uh, they're based in Illinois, and uh, outside of Moline or in Moline, in Illinois, it's the revenue last year was twenty-nine point eight billion. I don't doubt it. You know, we we have uh, cornfields behind us upstate. And they it's they they grow feed corn, and so that stays up a lot longer than people corn. But last weekend they processed the corn because it was dry enough to do that, and it was a John Deere machine. And I was amazed by this. The machine would actually go big, big, wide thing would scoop through the corn, and then you saw like the kernels themselves going into a hopper. I have no idea what happened to the rest of it. Then a truck would pull up. Yeah, pull no, truck. That's, and I that's walked that's down amazing. the cornfield last weekend or after they did it and every single corn husk that was left had no kernels on it. I, how? That's an amazing, but that's an expensive piece of equipment. Well, that, right? Their stuff's very expensive and that, you know, the farming obviously if, you're, if it's done on a, a mass level like that is extremely uh, expensive. He came to John Deere. Robert Lane started at John Deere in 1982. He left the commercial banking industry. He worked all over the world for the company. In uh, 2000, he was named president and CEO, and then he was elected chairman of the board in August. And during his tenure, revenues of the company doubled while he was there, so they were very happy with him. He's won a number of awards. He grew up, was born in D.C., went to school in Illinois, Wheaton College. So, happy birthday, Robert Lane. That's a good birthday. And, you know, that I stock, love John Deere. I like that brand. That stock and Caterpillar are looked at very critically often when it comes to the judging the health of the economy. Yep. Um, for a whole host of reasons, because those machines are used for, uh, for construction, for farming. Um, so, yeah, no, that's a... The company we, was founded in 1837. They've got 61,000 employees. Wow. Are they all located out in Illinois? All over the world. All over the world, okay. Global, global brand. As many of you know, Deep Discount is a partner of ours here on the Focus Group. Arr, Sharky the Shark. I had to get that in. Uh, <laughs> Where is Sharky? He hasn't shown up lately. The puppet. We have a hand puppet that I that I got down in Rehoboth. Rehoboth at the seashell shop. Hand seashell, puppet. Seashell what, what do we shop. learn in, in corporate America? If you're around all the time, people take you for granted. If you show up now and then, you're a star. So the puppet only comes out every now and then. So he's not here today, but he'll be he'll be here. It's in like the, the Costanzas on Seinfeld. They weren't every episode, but when they were there, <laughs> they were there. It's the uh, site-wide sale is going on now into next week, and it's going to be followed by a, a Black Friday cyber sale. But everything at Deep Discount is discounted already. But there's a big sale going on. We get to free range. We call it. We get to pick whatever we want <laughs> from the this, this site, which we're really happy about. And this usually gives me and Tim an opportunity to be very different because you gravitate towards some things, and I gravitate. Or another. So for a site-wide sale, what did you pick? So I, I think I'd picked something like this once before, but it, this popped up again as a special. This was released in 2015. It's called the Midnight Special, and it's 11 discs of uh, video of live performances from 1972 to 1981, which everybody remembers. Do you remember ever watching on Friday nights at 1 a.m.? Yeah. It would come on the Midnight Special. And they listed... Uh, oh, that's... This is a compilation yeah, that, of, all, of all the oh, shows okay. and all the performances, over 131 of them and uh, over these 11 discs. But they also had comedians like Richard Pryor, Andy Kaufman, Steve Martin, Freddie Prince, Flip Wilson, da-da-da-da-da. But the rock and roll part of it were live performances, and it's a who's who. It's everything from Aerosmith, ACDC, the Bee Gees, Fleetwood Mac, Jim Croce, Hart, John Denver, Tom Petty, the Doobie Brothers, Hall & Oates, ELO, The Cars, La Belle, Sly and the Family Stone, there's more, The Kinks, <laughs> Earth, Wind & Fire, uh, Helen Reddy, Sammy Hagar, Casey and the Sunshine Band, Linda Ronstadt, Marvin Gaye, Robert Palmer, Captain and Tennille, Ario Speedwagon, Steely Dan, your favorite, John, and uh, The Village People. So, I mean, yeah. You this how much are they charging for the eleven? So this list price is nine ninety nine ninety five. So hundred bucks. Deep Discount has it for thirty nine fifty five. And wow, for how many eleven discs? For eleven discs. Now, I why I recommend something like this is because you could try to go out and find it on YouTube or something. The quality is horrible, and uh, you're not going to get that. yeah the quality. The VHS is not good. quality yeah. or yeah or somebody has taken it off of something mm -hmm. off of something. But this is the actual um, performances that they, they have. And so for 11 discs, I, I like it because it's something you're not going to really find anywhere else. And so 
So uh, there was another one on there that we talked about once before that only had the six discs. Yes. But this one with 11, I thought, wow. All right, about so mid, the same price. midnight special. Okay, so I went with uh, video as well. I was, I thought you might have gone with audio because you, you know, you're, you're a music man. You we got audio next week. Got audio. Okay, so I went with a different thing. The past week, I was visiting my mom up in Connecticut. She's getting over uh, some surgery that she had, and I was visiting with her for a few hours. And I brought up my laptop and I showed her. I had a whole bunch of Pixar short films queued up, and she loved watching them and I loved watching her watching them and it reminded me that short films are great because you don't your commitment to them is seven eight ten minutes right <laughs> but a lot of great ideas get explored in short films especially with animated shorts so my pick was the Pixar short films collection three on blu-ray and dvd and it's got one two three four five six seven eight nine 10, 11, 12 shorts plus some bonuses. The one that I would draw your attention to that my mom adored is called Piper. And it's about a little bird that's learning how to eat mollusks at the beach. And my mom was fascinated by the fact that she thought it was like National Geographic. She goes, is this real? Or I said, this is an animation. Wow. So after the movie, we spent, it's only uh, the sh Piper is six minutes long. We spent about a half hour talking about how the animators brought that to life. And so, uh, you know, I think short films are great, and if there's obviously if this is called Pixar Short Films Collections Three, there's a one and a two. <laughs> so I have the one and the two, and I can highly recommend them as well. But this is something you could throw in. You watch one or two, you walk away, you come back, watch a few more, and you're and you get all different styles and all different stories. So that's my recommendation this week. This week, the uh, which I think is the best oh, of the round, Tim. Yeah, right I can, now. yeah. And it's The Crown, and uh, at deep discount right now this week for the new release is The Crown, the complete second season on Blu-ray. And I don't even know if I could give it justification in describing it, but it, it's essentially the, the life of Queen Elizabeth. Right? Yeah. I mean, Played by Claire Foy, yeah. who does a beautiful job. The acting, the sets, the direction, the writing, everything about this series makes it something you could watch repeatedly. So we've watched season one two or three times. I know that sounds crazy. Did you really? Well, especially well, you know why? Because you miss a lot, and I think you and you know, particularly when there's uh, there's a lot of scenes with Winston Churchill That's in the beginning where if you hear it, you're like, oh, okay, because there's a lot of foreshadowing or or or. Um, and it was those episodes which I was most intrigued by. John Lithgow in season one played Winston Churchill, and he did a great job doing it. Um, and Claire Foy is just marvelous to watch. I mean, sometimes the camera holds on her, and and. I guess the direction she's processing or thinking about something, or in many cases it would hold on her and she's like, I'm the queen. I can't show emotion. You know, it's a, it, they've done a great job. I, I love the series. I'm wondering whether, so the, the new series, so this is season two, but season three will be coming cast, out shortly cast. with a new cast, which I'm wondering how that's going to be. I'm sure it'll be good, but um, it's coming into now more times that we would remember, yeah. I guess. We're going into the... Um, I mean, the, we're, we're past the Kennedys. We're going into, into the, the 60s. Well, into the 70s, 80s. It would be Reagan's and, and and I believe there's going to be a Princess Lady Diana. Lady Di, yep. yeah, Lady so, Diana. But it, it's it's a it's a great series and just I, I enough said. Enough. I, I can't say enough. I can't <laughs> For say you enough. to like, well, you like history. Enough. Yeah, I do like it. And, and I think you like historical fiction when it's done really well. And this is done really well. Yeah. So be sure to head over to focusgroupradio.com. Please click on the Deep, Deep Discount logo and start shopping away. John recommended the Pixar Shorts number three. I recommended the Midnight Special. And uh, the release is season two of The Crown on, on Blu-ray. And uh, while you're over there at, on focusgroupradio.com, too, click on one of our platforms of choice and start liking us. Or, or do a review on iTunes. A or review something. or something, right? Yeah. We, we don't ask that enough, somebody said. Write a review. Like, like, subscribe. Subscribe, like, and rate us. Yeah. We hey, see it all the time. Hey. Right, Garrett? Thanks, Deep Discount. Stay with us. We're going to come right back. John found a shop talk that made me really scratch my head. There's something called a CLV, which is a customer lifetime value. Apparently, we all have a score none of us knew about. <laughs> and uh, John found this article, and we're going to discuss it right after this quick break. So stay with us. <laughs> Brought to you by the Volkswagen Tiguan. Visit VW.com to learn more. Focus on the savvy side of 9 to 5 with the Focus Group. Try, really try. Listen, laugh, and learn with Tim and John. I never try anything. I just do it. 
Welcome back to Focus Group. John Nash with Tim Bennett. FocusGroupRadio.com has all the platforms are on audio and video. And thanks for watching us live if you're on YouTube or Facebook. All right, so um, I came across an article that was published in the Wall Street Journal about a week ago, and the headline was what caught my eye, actually. It said, on hold for 45 minutes, it might be your secret customer score. And that got me to the article, and um, I'll just set it up by reading the first two paragraphs of the article. Two people call customer service at the same time to complain about the same thing. One waits a few seconds before a representative gets on the line. The other stays on hold. Why the difference? There's a good chance it has something to do with a rating known as a customer lifetime value, or CLV. That number is secret. It's used by all manner of companies to measure the potential financial value of their customers. Your score can determine the prices you pay, the products and ads you see, and the perks you receive. So from there, we learn that a CLV is not a FICO score, it's not a credit score, but it is a way that companies have of actually ascertaining your lifetime value in sales, and, and I think I'm doing this right, <laughs> to the brand. So cell companies have it, airline companies have it, auto brands, auto brands have it, and they, they buy these numbers from a variety of different companies that source the data, yep. amazing amounts of data, right? And everybody has a different way that they decide to do the score, and there was a, a professor from Penn talks about, he has his one one study that he does, and <laughs> I actually thought, John, we should do our own. He's the guy from Wharton. Yeah, I, yeah. I thought we could do do our own score and probably sell them too. But he, he because you use whether it's how many times do you return something, um, what level of purchase do you make, do you buy when things are just on sale or are you or a do you buy full customer? price? Yeah. And they said that the more profitable you are, the better service you'll get usually when you call into some of these lines. But what I the, the thing that I took away, they said, unlike credit scores, your CLV isn't available to consumers and isn't monitored by any government agency. So it could totally, we all know that they make mistakes on the credit score. So this could this could be an issue where you might have had a, a problem with, say you had a problem with a cell phone service and you did call a lot and all of a sudden you're dinged as a bad customer. And because they're spending money on you. But the, but yeah. Right, but there's no way you could could change that. Or they said banks will track how often you go into a branch. branch yep. I was baffled by this because you and I have both worked with brands and worked for companies. I've never heard about this before. I know at Subaru with our customer service desk, unless it was kept very quiet just amongst the people in that department, I never heard of a thing like this. I never heard about it working with dealerships. This was such a good article because it's, it was an unknown practice to me. Yeah. Now, there is a paragraph I'll, I'll, I want to point out, and I, I'm sure that you highlighted this as well. In some respects, the scores are just a high-tech version of what shopkeepers have done for generations, make judgments on a customer's value based on how they look or behave. As far back as 20 years ago, academics were publishing models to calculate the future value of a customer so that you walk into a store and you're sized up yeah. by the sales team. Interestingly, that's been put on its head by the way people dress nowadays. Yeah. There are some we we once interviewed someone who said that at some of the most high-end stores in the world, their sales staffs are told to not judge anybody because you never know how someone looks, right? Well, that was that famous story which happened, what was it, 3 or 4 years ago when Oprah went into Hermès in Paris? Yeah. She went into the store to buy Hermès bags for her friends, which were like $10,000 a piece or something. And she wasn't in all her full makeup. She wasn't her Oprah. She wasn't Oprah. But on they TV. totally profiled her as this black woman who probably, in their mind, um, ran her through the ringer and weren't going to accept her credit card and wanted to do all kinds of checks. Meanwhile, any of us in this country would be like, Oprah yeah. wants to buy the store, let her have right, it. Have the store. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's that whole profiling thing of what you this looking guy at that, somebody and deciding whether you're 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 a good customer. And or not. the person you talked about before, Peter Fader. Mm -hmm. From Wharton, and he said it. He sums it up best, in my opinion. Not all customers deserve a company's best efforts, um, and by that he means, you know, you may, you may be a pain in the butt to a company, right? You call all the time. You want customer service, whatever. But things affect the score, like marital status. And generally speaking, I was surprised to see that they value customers who are single more than they're married because they'll spend more money. Age is a concern or a common tactic. Penalizing older people because of their shorter projected lifespans. So you're, if, you're, if you become a customer of a brand in your 60s, well, you know, you're only going to be a customer for, you know, 30 years maybe. 
hopefully. I love this one. Someone who has a Neiman Marcus credit card is going to be more valuable for a car dealership than someone from a card at a discount chain. Yeah. <laughs> now, I have a friend of mine who was banned from shopping at Target. They refused to let. So he would buy things and he returned too much. Yeah, you tell me about this. So the fact that he returned too much, they eventually said to him when he would try to return again, they said, no, you're not allowed to return, which I didn't think was allowed. But they said that we have you've returned. You're you're a chronic buyer returner. I don't know what the right word would be. But um, so he was banned from uh, returning anything. Yeah, something. So So you have to return a lot of stuff to get banned, don't you think? You do. And basically, you have to be going every week. Yeah, well, that's what he was doing. And bringing the receipt back. And, and But he wasn't a stylist for... A- he was doing stuff for photo shoots. Thought he was being smart. So he would take, he'd go to Target, buy all this stuff, style the rooms, get the pictures taken, return the stuff, do it. Next, yeah, and this was a pattern. So they caught on. <laughs> I think his mother was banned, too, though, I think, because she was catching a up. A CLV, though. You know, and I think it was a previous broadcast, you and I talked about uh, Wayfair and how much they spend to get a customer. Yep. So this goes hand in hand with that thinking in, in some ways because they want to, whatever internal data they use, they want to make sure that you're either being taken care of very well or not. Um, the car one was a surprise to me, by the way, dealerships and cars. I didn't think dealers were that sophisticated. I could be wrong. Well, they do, you know, they run their credit check like all, you know, when you're buying yeah. a big purchase yeah. like that, they'll run the, the one of the three credit services. But yeah, I've never heard of a dealer and I've been in hundreds of dealerships over my career and I've never seen or knew of the practice. Now, I don't know. Do you have to pay for this service, I guess? If you're a company, you must have to. Somebody's got to pay for it. Yes. The the company that buys these numbers from one of these companies does, in fact, pay for it. I, and and where they're mining, where the company that sells the number mines the data. I mean, they were talking in the article about 5,000 data points. Most of us have a number of scores, like one company could have a scored one right. way or another. I guess we're all over the place, right? Now, I had an interesting... So I last night, I, I called L.L. Bean. And, um, I mean, before I dialed, somebody picked up at the call center, and she was in Maine. She was in Portland, Maine. And I want, I had some issues online. I, I was confused and having trouble ordering, shipping. ordering the shipping. items and the shipping. And immediately handed me off to a senior-level customer service person. Hi, Mr. Bennett, how are you? Blah, 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 blah. Trying to sell me the credit card, too. I said no, but then I threw out the owner's name of the of the because I, the way this thing worked is if you spent over fifty dollars, you got free shipping. shipping. But the items that are, that I bought totaled over three hundred, but they were going different places, so they were charging me shipping for each item, <laughs> which I thought was wrong. Yeah, <laughs> don't you? If I'm making a purchase of four hundred, I'm making a three hundred dollar, four hundred dollar purchase, but I want the stuff sent to three different places. I guess there is a cost for them to box it up. Mm-hmm. Amazon doesn't do it that way. Free shipping. It's free shipping. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, they somehow figure out, even if the order is being divvied up into different locations, you still pay the shipping cost, which whatever that is. So Ella Bean's great-grandson, Sean Gorman, runs the place. So I said you to know him. So I, said, I met him, so, actually. Right. So I, said, so I said to the, I said, I'm going to tell Sean about this. She goes, oh, he's the one who implemented the policy. She goes, he is well, getting. He put you right through. He, 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 when's the last time you saw him? I said, well, we saw him two summers ago. I said, but I can imagine he's doing this. And and she laughed. But she said, you know, she said, I can. It's the way it is. She said, if you don't do the 25%, you know, she she was trying to, she was trying to work with me. At the end of the day, I had to pay the shipping. But uh, I wasn't happy about it. (laughs) But I wondered, I mean, literally the phone, I didn't have to wait a second. It rang once and somebody picked up. I don't know that you, well, you are a Bean customer. But I'm just wondering if they just have good customer service. I, I, all right, so one, the, the article was written by the Wall Street Journal, and the author did, in fact, contact uh, Sprint, Verizon, uh, Bank of America. They contacted a couple companies, and one of the company representatives said, we don't deal with, we, we, we deal with customer service issues based on what they're asking. I have a problem with an ATM card. I have a problem with this. They, they route the call based on that, not yeah. on... They they claim not on that, but um, that was from the journal, right? Wall Street Journal. Wall Street journal. Yeah, so I was fascinated by it. So I w- remember, I'd like to find out what your score is. I wonder what a good score is. You know, um, we all have. If you do you use Uber or Lyft, 
I, Rarely. I use it, but I don't use it. You know, you have a score. I, you have an Uber score. So, like, I have an Uber score, and I actually found mine out. You can go. There's a. You could Google this and say, "How do I know my Uber rating?" And you can go into the settings, and you can actually and then What's email. Your score? Oh, I'm a five star rider, a driver. So, oh, what that me. means is, when I hit the button to request a car, they know you're good. The drivers are actually. That Gating request apparently goes out to the top drivers first, and but they're competing to get those five-star riders. Now I know you're not going to throw up in the car. <laughs> do you give Do you give a tip in I cash, do. or do you do it on I the do app? On the app, I do it on the app. I don't like the fact you have to tip anymore. But you don't have to do it. At I all. mean, you know, you have to now. The last couple drivers I said had they expect a tip like a cab, and I thought the whole thing about Uber was you don't tip. That was the beautiful thought part of it. It was a, it was a known number. I'm going to go from that's here to it, here. That's it, right? And that's what people loved it. Yeah. But now you have to tip. Guess what? <laughs> Welcome to the world, right? Yeah. So you got a tip by your Uber driver, and apparently everybody has a customer lifetime value or a CLV. We are going right, to take a gonna take, oh, go ahead. Yeah, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we have nine lessons from the Hardy Boys. Everybody remembers the old Hardy Boy books. John found this article. Might be a little wonky, but we'll get through it. And share with you the nine lessons. <laughs> nine lessons from the Hardy Boys. John's. John's. What, 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 were you? You were such a Uber, I love Uber Hardy, Boys Hardy Boys. Hardy Boys. Did you read every book? I, and you know they mentioned the Hardy Boys Detective Handbook in here. I was so happy the Christmas I got the Detective Handbook. Yeah. Stay with us. Hardy Boys are next. You know it's coming. <laughs> Brought to you by the seven-seater Volkswagen Atlas. Life's as big as you make it. Visit VW.com to learn more. Focus on the savvy side of 9 to 5 with the Focus Group. And in business a week, I got more money than I know what to do with. Listen, laugh, and learn with Tim and John. Herrera Rocher. Yeah. He is doing well. Scotch tape and pound your finger. <laughs> Welcome back to the Focus Group. John Nash with Tim Bennett. FocusGroupRadio.com for all our platforms. Tim is laughing because I was telling him during the break that when I got my Hardy Boys Detective Handbook, I learned how to do fingerprinting. You, you, you put talcum powder on the area, put a piece of tape down, pull up the powder, put on a paper, you get the fingerprint. I was running around the house trying to find anybody. I found my mom, my dad, my sister. <laughs> so I came across this article and it was uh, on a site called Manliness or something like that. Mm. Um, what were you doing there by accident? It, it, it was it was aggregated into my, one of my feeds, one of my um, news feeds. I don't know where they pulled this from. I know. But a bump. Yeah. You know, you, you just, <laughs> I got it. Right over. The boys in the booth are laughing. Of course they are. And they're you laughing. Run right over it. They're laughing because they know I'm running over because I also got it. <laughs> if I throw these things out, they just fall. Oh, no, no, no. They do not fall. When I'm in the and car and I listen. Bob to laugh. I, when I listen to the show, we bust out. Trust me, we bust out laughing. So, yeah, I found it on a site called Manliness. <laughs> and why I was there is anybody's Who guess. Who knows, right? <laughs> For ladies. It was networking. <laughs> it was for ladies. Can I have a ladies' handbag? We're doing Little Britain. <laughs> the article is called Nine Lessons from the Hardy Boys. And I grew up with these guys. And after I finished the Hardy Boys series, I then read the Nancy Drew series. And then I read Alfred Hitchcock and the Three Investigators. I mean, I was a kid that read a okay, lot. Okay, okay, okay. Why were you reading Nancy Drew? I ran out of book. I ran out of the Hardy Boys, and she was a. She did. did your she, sister have Nancy Drew? Oh, they had. Yeah, she had. They had Bobsy Twins. Was it the Nancy same story, Drew. just girls? Basically, and Nancy Drew had a, a friend who was a guy. So it was the, her and the guy would go around and solve. So it was. You know, you thought you, you thought, oh, it's a girls' book. It's just a bunch of people solving problems. Yeah. And actually, Nancy Drews are a little more cerebral. The Hardy Boys are about getting into the action. Well, that was the line I pulled out of here about it. it said that the Hardy Boys embodied many of the ideals of masculinity. Mm hmm. Which I don't know if I would have would have labeled it like that. Would you? It was on a site about manliness. I, uh, <laughs> so I think I the author corrected. had to do that. Stand corrected. So skill number one, or lesson number one, develop a wide variety of skills. Frank and Joe Hardy knew how to fix cars, bikes, camp. They could camp. They could canoe, navigate the woods, scuba dive, talk in sign language, speak Spanish, track animals and humans, hold their breath for longer than a minute, and sneak around stealthily. Their father also taught them how to properly handle firearms, and both boys are excellent marksmen, although they rarely use guns on the job. In fact, they, I don't remember guns being in the books at all, except for 
being taught how to use them properly. So these books came out in 1927. They've been around ever since, yeah. And and so when the, the guy who did this story, so essentially it's one of these of everything, you know, the lessons you would learn or you yeah. take away from this. And I I um, I had an overall theme, which we'll get to at the end, but um, we'll go yeah, through, we'll the, go, we'll go through, through the these quick, though, first. because we don't have to, like... Right. The, the, the second was, was being perennially... Perennially. <laughs> perennially curious. And uh, so it says the Hardy Boys skills aren't just of the physical variety, but extend to the mental realm as well. The detectives are often able to make logical deductions and find connections between various incidents and pieces of evidence. So they talk about um, essentially being lifelong learners, about always being That's curious. That's exactly right, Tim. Be perennially curious. What was number three? Strengthen your powers of observation. So many of us see things, but we don't really observe them. You're not really looking for detail, and we the things go by us all the time. So all this was is a sense of train yourself to observe and to remember and not just see things. And I get this all the time from my art lectures as well. Who made the famous quote, uh, I'm going to forget, but it was, it's better to be looked over than to be overlooked. Oh, that's, <laughs> was, was that, that's that, I don't know. Was that um, from the 20s with the... What's her name? Mae West. Mae West. Was that Mae maybe West? Maybe maybe it was Mae West. It's better. It's better to be looked over than overlooked. Better to be looked over than overlooked. Yeah, that goes right with my granddad. Better to be uh, better to be razzed that razzed than ignored. Like, yeah, well, you know. There you go. What's number five? Number four was three, carry. Or, you did number three. Number number four was carry a robust EDC. I didn't know what an EDC was, but it was an everyday. Uh, everyday carry all, but essentially is always be prepared. This reminded me a little bit of the Boy, Boy Scouts. Scouts. Boy Scouts, yeah. but my dad's like this. Whenever we were doing a trip, you got a flashlight, you got yeah. this, you got a blanket. You got hey, a hey, your dad, your dad, you're the same way. That the, every time I get a new car, you say to me, "Gotta get this, gotta get here's that." Here's what's going in the back, and if it's the winter time, you better put some bottled water in. You better have some kitty litter to, a you blanket, know, a blanket, have some, a little shovel if you can, mm -hmm. and a, one of those hazard things, the little square, the things you could put up if you're out the side of the road. A scraper. Yeah. The flashlight's the most important thing. Did you read the Hardy Boys? I love the Hardy Boys. Oh, all right. But what I and and after I read through all these, I thought I want to read them again. <laughs> and they tell you they said one through sixteen were the best. And this guy read one through sixteen yeah, or I, twenty two. I'm I'm tempted to read them. I'm, I'm sure they're. Would you? I before. I can give you one through sixteen before I ship them off to my cousin's <laughs> new grandson. I, 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 a boy needs these books. All right, the next number one. Number five. Father by example and be a mentor to your children. So. The author says, rereading The Hardy Boys as a grown man and a father, I was really struck by what a warm and supportive home Fenton Hardy and Laura Hardy created for their sons, particularly what an exemplary dad they have. And then, he, of course, now that we know it's coming from manliness.com, manly, athletic, intelligent, thoughtful, and full of unwavering integrity. Fenton reminds me of another upstanding literary father, Atticus Finch. <laughs> That's high bar. That's high brow. High bar, yeah. Number six, I, I, I put in the side notes this, that this is lost in our, our day and age, but uh, number six oh. was have confidence in your children and be a free-range parent. It essentially was give, give the freedom to your kids to kind of go out and experiment and do what they want to do. They said the permissive and trusting attitude of the Hardy Boys parents um, contrasted with that of, of um, their Aunt Gertrude, but essentially how the parents let the kids go out and play and explore and do things. And... You know, I remember my mom when I was in high school. I, my senior year, I got a phone call from Marianne and Jennifer on a Sunday night, and they said, "Do you want to go to Ohio with us tomorrow? We're going to go look at colleges." Oh my God! And I, I said to this. my mom, "I said, hey mom, can I go to Ohio tomorrow with Marianne? Well, we need. A, right, my dad said we need a guy to go in case we get a flat tire." Right. And so I'm like, "Mom, can I go to Ohio tomorrow to go look at colleges? You're already going to UConn, aren't you?" I said, "Yeah, but Marianne's going to." Well, I don't care. Is your homework done? And off I went to Ohio for Ohio. three days. Would your parents ever let a kid do that now? I don't know. Nowadays, no. But when we, so you, the, that, our, that one, that number, you know, free range parenting ends with uh, the Hardy Boys' dad gave them a long leash because he was confident in their maturity and aptitude. Yeah. He trusted them, in other words. Yeah. He knew that they would probably Trust. make the right decision. But I agree with you. Uh, and I, this goes back to when we were younger. We would leave the house and walk down to the drugstore. And there was, a, there was a brook down the road that we used to play in and send little log things down. And, and now and then the pharmacist would call my mom and say, hey, Carol, I want you to know the kids were in buying penny candy about an hour ago. Okay, <laughs> thanks. You know, it doesn't happen now. Um, what was number eight? This one, uh, every man needs a gang. Oh, that's number seven. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. No, you got it right. Number yeah, seven. seven. In contrast to Nancy Drew, who typically solves her cases alone and is almost always featured alone on the covers of her books, this is true, the Hardy Boys rarely single-handedly solve their mysteries. Instead, the brothers team up not only with each other, but with their father and their friends, operating in what has been the basic unit of male society since time immemorial. They all male gang. Manliness.com. Um, <laughs> now that I know where you got this from, it makes it even funnier. Sorry, yeah. So, um, I remember Chet, their friend Chet, their, and Chet would always go with them in the sleuth, their motorboat, remember? So the gang thing to me just means have a good set of peers and friends. Yeah. yeah. Number eight was be persistent. And this what? says the, the heart at all the Hardy Boys was their dogged persistence and determination. Once they got in a case, no amount of obstacles or dangers can deter them from solving it. And this is essentially not giving up. Um, you're going to get roadblocks in life. You're going to run into things, and you're going to have to be able to think on your feet and uh, handle the detours. And so persistence is important. Otherwise, people give up, and then you don't get anywhere. So I thought that was a good one. It's a very And, and in the last one, number nine, is approach life like a detective. And if you look at the word detect in Latin, it means to uncover, expose, discover, or reveal. And so a good detective observes. Um, they don't take stories by, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't trust the pat story the minute you hear it. Be selfless. Risk, risk your life to aid others. Detectives strive to track down and expose those who disrupt the scales of justice. That was very uh, Hardy Boys, right? So um, that's, the, that's the list here. And uh, the author concludes by saying, I've come to conclude that what drew me and millions of others to the Hardy Boys growing up was a, di a desire to take their approach to sleuthing and apply to all of life, which is what you said earlier. Be a lifelong learner. Be interested. Be engaged. Well, this sure. reminded me a lot. There's a lot of, and you and I both have a liberal arts education, which has been in the news a lot, getting dinged as not as being worthless, a lot of people will say. And this, this to me, as I read this, I thought, you know, this really embodies a lot of those traits of being, yeah. or having a liberal arts education. You're curious, curious for life, lifelong learner. Yeah. You know, you know a lot about a bunch of different topics, and yes, you, you're not an expert in a lot of things, but you certainly could get your way around. And that's what the Hardy Boys' success was, wasn't it? And I do remember our, our friend Will Chapman. You know Will Chapman. Yeah. So Will Chapman one day calls me up, and I guess he bought me an old hard. It's one of my favorite books on one of, on my shelf. He bought me a a copy of one of my Ju Jupiter Jones, Alfred Hitchcock, and the Three Investigators. They were a little more mature than the Hardy Boys, but I I discovered that Will loved that series as well, and he found one at a, at a tag sale one day, and then he calls me up and he says, you know, I bought one or two copies of those books, and he goes, I read them again, <laughs> and I said, well, how were they? And he goes, he goes, you know what? He goes, they're actually. You, as an adult, you fly through that book because it's written in such clear, simple language. And I said, did you enjoy it? He goes, oh, yeah, I enjoyed it. He goes, I wouldn't sit read read them all again. He said, but I now know why I was so captivated by them as a kid. So, Well, that's why I'm curious about. So if you read the very first Hardy Boys book. Yeah. Written in 1927. I'm wondering how it holds up today. I think it'd be a good experiment for us. I think it would be a great experiment, actually. Um I saved, I have my, I'm, I'm just getting ready to give my cousin, because he has a grandson now, all my Hardy Boy books. Because my nieces, they're way past that time. Right. And, and I had, my grandparents used to love giving me Hardy, I mean, every Christmas I got at least, and the hardback, the blue hardbacks, the four or five copies. I'm giving him everything but books one, two, and three. Because to me, those, it was the house on the cliff, Tower Treasure, and the Old Mill or something. I think I might have got those wrong. But to me, those covers just signal like you know sleuthing, and so I, yeah, I, no, I, I I could have those three on my shelf for the rest of my life and be happy. I don't need all fifty nine or how many I have. My favorite cover was the one with the secret mill. There was the mill. looking through the crack, and then there was one yeah, with the secret a of the old mill of the old mill. And there's one with the grandfather clock that I loved. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And, the, and in fact, they're tied up. Yeah. And and there's a guy like coming out from the clocks, like the, it's like a secret panel or something. Oh my God, I have that a cover, a copy of that I cover. To move to that town, a lot going on. Bayport. What is it called? Bayport? <laughs> and in fact, they said at one point in the article that a lot of crime happened. Yeah. 
a, dis a disproportionate amount of crime occurs in their hometown of Bayport. <laughs> it reminds me a little bit of the themes to a Dennis the Menace. Have you ever watched any of the old Dennis the Menace? And they always make the cops be kind of these bumbling fools. And you get Keystone cops. Dennis and his friends can get everything figured out. So, uh, But that was a good one, the Hardy Boys. So, hey, we want to thank everybody for uh, for joining us here today. Remember to go to MacWeldon.com, and if, you're, uh, if you type in the promo code FOCUS, you get 20% off your first order. We highly recommend... The uh, the T-shirts, the underwear, the half zip, which I stolen. need. Stolen. Stolen. Stolen half zip. <laughs> and in uh, the clothing from Mack Weldon. It's great quality clothing. And uh, you get what you pay for. So remember that. Thanks to our friends at Deep Discount. John, what did you pick this week? Oh, the Pixar you shorts? The Pixar shorts. I picked the Midnight Special 11 disc collection. It's a site-wide sale. The new release is The Crown. Season, season 2. two um, Blu-ray. Thanks to our friends at Volkswagen. If you go to VW.com, right now, the year-end specials, I don't have to tell you, but there's some great deals going on right now. It's for motion season, so of course you're going to want to make sure that you look at cars that have all-wheel drive, because John and I believe in that. Mm -hmm. right, John? I our, swear by all-wheel drive, Our, our Volkswagen All Tracks have been doing as well, and uh, we always recommend that you look at the for motion products from Volkswagen. So be sure to do that. Next week, we have David Fry joining us from the National Dog Show, which takes place on Thanksgiving. So are you going to watch the dog show this year? I am definitely going to watch the dog show because I, I know there's two new breeds being introduced. I can't pronounce don't them. Pronounce, you can't. Yeah, we're not going to do that. <laughs> so, hey, don't text and drive. Arrive alive, and we'll see you uh, next week right before Thanksgiving. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.